Robert Robinson. Hello. Our conversation this evening comes from Dr. Rosalind Miles of Coventry Lanchester Polytechnic, Nicholas Tucker, lecturer in psychology at Sussex University, Milton Shulman, drama critic of The Standard, and Laurie Taylor, professor of sociology at York University. Music from Dilly Keane of Fascinating Aida. Now, I've, I've just got a footnote to that stuff last week about Parsifal, a very long opera, to save a witch, as Stephen told us last week, you had to exercise patience. And Alan Wykes of Reading reminds me of the remark made by, and he thinks it is, George G. Nathan, the American critic. Parsifal is an opera by Wagner that begins at 5.30. Four hours later, you look at your watch, and it's 20 to 6. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Stands the test of time. Now... <laughs> Uh, we have another of those pleasing little social dilemmas. Uh, it reaches Dr. Rhubarb, and it's especially relevant just now with the approach of polling day and the borough elections. It's this. What do you say when you open the door and the chap canvassing says, can we count on your vote? It's awfully easy to start stammering, isn't it? Because the bloke's question presumes a relationship you hadn't been aware of till you opened the door. Damn cheek, in short. But what do you say? that afterwards won't make you dance with annoyance because you said too little, or because you said too much. Well, my friend in East Molesey, who put the point to me, smiled sweetly at the canvasser and simply said, we'll see. I can't think of a briefer way of combining civility with truth, though my friend's wife, who heard the exchange, said he'd been very rude. When he shut the door, he looked at the literature the chap had thrust on him and tells me the minute he saw the fellow was a dentist practising in Ewell, he felt he oughtn't to have been so short with him. Evidence that the canvasser was part of the world of work lent him a reality he didn't otherwise possess. I have to admit, my East Molesy friend went on, that when I see a canvasser coming up my garden path, I assume he's someone with time on his hands who isn't happy at home. But before we consider the hidden life of the canvasser, do they hibernate between elections? Do they gather on telephone wires prior to flying south? What reply do you give when asked for your vote? Well, it certainly wouldn't be. We'll see, because... I'm one of the wretched legion of canvassers myself, and what happens if you get that particular answer is you then put down in your little card a doubtful or query, which then means that the person who's still seeing is going to be visited about three or four times oh, more. I see. The warning it's is well, quite the, the wrong answer. But you can't just give a sweet smile and say nothing. It's, a, it's like the dilemma when the policeman stops you and you've been going too fast, and then he says, have you got anything to say? Anything you say will be put down, like, no, I haven't, and it will sound very belligerent. It's very difficult to simply to smile and stay silent when you're asked a question. I you could answer the, the question. technique is, I'm sure, to fight the question with a question. So when they say, can you count on can they count on your vote? You say sympathetically, are you doing well round here? What sort of a turnout are you expecting? Now, have you been to old Mrs. Pettifer up Church Lane? She ah, has such trouble with her knees. You no, don't this have is that absolutely right. And by the time they think they're in the hands of the local Mrs. Quickly, sitting by a seacoal <laughs> fire a Wednesday or Whitson week, they can't get away fast uh, well, enough. You can do a bit of political it. work. My friend Dave uh, uses the strategy whenever anybody from the Conservative Party calls round, being a socialist himself, when they arrive and say, can we count on your vote for the Conservative Party? although he's lived by himself for years, has only one room in his flat, says, I'm sorry, we're all Labour here, <laughs> suggesting there are 50 <laughs> international socialists in the back room waiting to vote. My, uh, my reaction uh, when, um, I won't say what party comes along, I say to them, well, I have supported your party in the past, but I have considerable doubts about whether I will do so in the future. But that, 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 no, that leaves them in the delay. In the, in the, whether or not they're going to start up a discussion with you. Are they going to justify nationalization? Or are they going to justify what we did in Libya? You know, one leaves them, and then they have to... In other words, you throw 
the argument at their feet and let them pick it now, up. Now, we'd write on the canvassing thing, we'd write a Talkative. warning B or something there, <laughs> boring, uh, just waste your time, yes, don't yes. call yes. again. You see, first, dreadful, my yes. first impression, my first feeling about it was that to be a canvasser, you've got to have an awfully thick skin and be a very extrovert person. But on consideration, I realised it was a wonderful bolt hole for the shy and the lonely, those people that my friend who lives in East Molesey, I mean, that's his prejudice, that they're all shy and lonely and disappointed and have nothing to do because with the rosette whatever the color red blue or whatever you are as it were under a flag of truce you can walk into those mind private areas you know those little front gardens that really say keep off you walk up knock at the door and confront a stranger with all the possibilities of rebuff standardized like we're all labor we all made labor here or conservative whatever it may be and the possibility, under this sort of prophylactic shield that you've got, of meeting people who are like-minded. You see, so I should think it's really the very shy and the uh, and the in uh, the, the, the sort of church mice. No, 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 no. Because after all, they have got to combat the ingrained drawbridge mentality of the British, who are absolutely all poised to repel invaders. In contrast to other cultures, where they will invite you in and give you a glass of wine and ask you your opinion on the state of the nation. That would so. certainly put a canvasser off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. In you knew you had to face that. <laughs> We're absolutely paranoid about people knocking on our door. And quite Just rightly. It isn't only uh, the politicians that come to your front door. Woody Allen, apparently, uh, in his latest film, he's confronted by the Harry Krishna people, and he thinks to himself, should I join them? He said, well, this mean I have to shave my head put on robes and dance around at airports. <laughs> <laughs> when I've canvassed, I've sometimes um, knocked on the door and the growlings of dogs and chinking of chains, and then a little old lady will open it, and we have quite nice conversations. I have the feeling that sometimes I'm the first person she's spoken to for about three weeks. And while one I went round, she said, see that clump of nettles there? Get the government to take that away and I'll vote for you. And although I, I said I didn't really have those powers, I didn't feel I'd actually done a bad job. I think My this friend, is all a reflection on Nicholas's extremely sweet personality. If he knocked on my door, I'd, I'd absolutely pounce on him and pull him in and make him drink Whoops. wine and talk about the state of the nation. I think what we really ought to concentrate on what is what's the nature of this transaction. It's not business. Right. If they're selling you something, you know if you want it or not. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who's bought a stupid brush with 15 attachments in, as a way of getting... But that's strictly business. With this thing, they're after a little piece of yourself. Right. They right. want you to tell them something which has traditionally been secret. I mean, my fa father had this idea that there were various things you never asked another chap. One of the things was how much he earned, and the other was which way he voted. And so you feel that they're invading your they're privacy. They're in a dilemma, Rosalind, because, mm. I mean, the reason that people go around canvassing is to try to remind those people they think will be supporting their party when the date is, and to try to get them to come out by suggesting that their vote is needed. Sort of the nature of that interaction, I, I mean, it's very, very funny, of course, when it breaks down. I remember the funniest occasion that I ever had was for some reason, for, to write an article, I was following Peter Tatchell around when, in that famous Bermondsey by-election in which he'd been so vilified by the national mm. press in the most outrageous way. And in a, with a vague idea of correcting that balance, I actually followed him around. And he was a most sort of vigorous canvasser, and he raced up and down these large blocks of flats in Bermondsey with his message. And I can remember him knocking on one door, and there was a long wait, and one of Nicholas's sort of old ladies eventually, an elderly lady, came to the door and held it just that little bit of jar, that suspicious amount of jar, whereupon Peter Tatchell went into his very practiced uh, routine, and he said, uh, oh, hello, he said, I'm calling on behalf of the Labour Party, my name's Peter Tatchell, we hope that you can count on your vote for the Labour Party at the forthcoming uh, by-election. He said, uh, you know you can trust me, I live just round here, and she just looked at him for a moment, she said, I wouldn't trust anyone who lives round here. <laughs> <laughs> There's all Milton, you were well, no, no, uh, what I was going to say is that the, uh, the political <laughs> Canvassing is not a conviction exercise. It's not meant to be that at all, compared to the, what I would call uh, the religious canvassing, where they literally don't mind, mm. once you get into a discussion with them, uh, uh, spending a uh, half an hour with you if they, if they think that you, you might become a convert. In politics, you see them on television, you see these MPs literally dashing mm. uh, 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 from door to door, giving each one about 30 seconds, and they're not meant mm. in any way to try to convince anybody about anything. But there's always for the man who's behind the door. There's always the possibility of getting a sudden glimpse, just well, no, it was the other way round with uh, and the old lady, but the, to, uh, for getting suddenly you open the door, yeah. um, or you're listening behind, as I was in the election. Oh, the first election after the 1945 one, and a woman knocked at the door, 
and asked my mother which way she was going to vote. And uh, my mother said, well, I don't know, really. What, what would you on the whole say that the difference was? And I was in the back of the house somewhere, and I was listening to it. And the genteel woman, very genteel person, was said, with the air of Bertrand Russell analysing the whole thing, she said, well, you know how dreadful everything's been <laughs> since the war? Hmm... <laughs> Well, that's the socialists. <laughs> and I was in either the back room swapping up beer wolf or doing something like that. My raucous laugh, I could not be repressed. <laughs> the worst moment is, though, the gap when so sometimes you go around with a car and you're attempting to persuade people to jump in the car mm. and then you will bribe them. I mean, you're, in a oh, way, yeah. you'll pay for their vote by taking them to the polling station. And when you do that uh, and you get them in, you suddenly realise if the conversation goes on, that you don't really want their vote anyway, mm. because they'll say, oh, yes, we're definitely voting for you, we want to keep the blacks out, yeah. and, you, <laughs> and you hear yourself going, well, uh, uh, that's not the... Uh, and you're stuttering. But that sense that you, in a way, that if the conversation was extended, you'd find out things you didn't want to hear, and the strain of canvassing. I remember being caught, Simon Hoggart was writing once about Keith Joseph, who was out canvassing and, and going up and down the streets and he suddenly noticed that Keith Joseph, I think he wrote this up in the Guardian a few years ago, perhaps at the last election, that Keith Joseph had disappeared and he wondered where he'd gone and he went back to try and retrace him and he found that Joseph had actually gone into a shop at the side of the road, it was, I think it was a carpet shop and there were rolls of carpet. He thought, what's he canvassing in here for? So he went round and he peered round the corner of the rolls of carpet and there was Joseph standing entirely by himself, <laughs> stock still behind the rolls of carpet. So Hoggett said he came away quietly and left him there, but that was the strain of canvassing yes. and forcing yes. yourself yes. out. This can't be overlooked. <laughs> that the man, you're, you're, you can win as a canvasser because the person who opens the door is actually, for the first time since the last election, um, someone in whom someone else is quite specifically interested. That's to say, his opinions are being, yes, that's the word, canvassed, aren't they? In between elections, the voter, speaking of myself, forgets that his vote is of any importance to anyone but himself. And so perhaps quite a lot of people will welcome someone turning up at the doorstep and saying, uh, how, how do you think the world's wagging, and so forth and so on. Quite a lot of people are probably quite willing to find themselves the centre of attention. What I think is regrettable is that they stop being the centre of attention after the government's return. That's yes, true, but, and it, but I... also you try saying that, Bob, to uh, someone who's just got out of their bath or a oh, yes, mother with yes, three children so. screaming. I mean, at the back, you really do feel guilty then. You feel the last thing on her mind is how she's going to vote. She's got much more pressing Yeah, concerns. but uh, in a way you are bringing the news of the person's mm. importance. Suddenly, mm. you're knocking at the door saying, look, you're important. And but also, I think if people really want to find their own version of the modern version of no hawkers, no circulars, they do so. Because I was recently riding in a very obscure corner of Oxfordshire, and I passed a farm with a notice on the gate saying, no callers, no salesmen, no one admitted without an appointment. <laughs> then in capital letters, this means you keep out. <laughs> and I was really absolutely charmed with the resolute curmudgeonliness of it. So what did you do? <laughs> Leap in and to get to know him? <laughs> it felt like going home to sort of winch up my own drawbridge. Absolutely. But I think it is the only bit of contact which now really occurs in politics. I mean, with the decline of public yep. meetings, with the sort of absence of heckling, with the absence of any mass meetings, the only little moment where really anyone comes in contact with you and that sort of paste piece of paper you stick the X on is when a canvasser calls. And if you're going to do without canvassers as well, you're going to rely entirely upon messages from the television by well-groomed, nose-straightened, voice-articulated politicians. I would yes. just like to be sure I had the right responses when canvassed in any sort. Uh, I was, I was, I was uh, filling up with petrol, went in to pay the bill, and the bloke simply said, how much did that car cost you? <laughs> and I'm sure there's a better response than the one I gave, which was, surely that is my business. <laughs> so really, all the time afterwards, you're wondering, it's not Esprit d'Escalier, it's just, have you said anything sensible? Because the other person always knows the lines and you don't. However, I'm sure Dilly Keane knows the lines, and I, God, you won't believe it, what she's called the song she's going to sing. Can I count on your vote? <laughs> Dear madam, please excuse me for a moment. Can we speak? I'd like to know if I can count on your support for me next week. I'm standing for election, and I think you will agree. It isn't just the policies that count, it's personality. But these alone won't win me the election, that is plain. So to discredit my opponents is the heart of my campaign. I've got to have the guts to fight below the belt. If two blows back.
like for everyone the opposition's dealt. Don't vote for him. His record is appalling. He was once arrested for curb crawling. His Alsatian bit a toddler just outside his spacious grounds. His investments in South Africa gross a million pounds. He wants to bring back hanging, and what's more, he rides to hounds. Is he the kind of man you should elect? Don't vote for her. Her ideas may seem appealing. They'll soon pull. When your rate bill hits the ceiling, she'll be taking trips to Poland and to Russia on the rates. She'll finance every fringe group that holds aloft its plate. She has plans to make Kew Gardens an industrial estate. Is this the kind of person to elect? Don't vote for him. He may give a good oration, but it's true. That his daughter's on probation. He got expelled for cheating at the tender age of ten. His youngest is a junkie, and his wife is into Zen. And it's known he has a penchant for seeing other men. Is this the kind of man you should elect? Some vote for me. There's no skeletons in my closet. Vote for me. Give me back my deposit. You may think I'm fighting dirty, but there's one thing you must see: it's standard practice to indulge in some skullduggery. So I've no scruples in exposing each and every enemy, for they've done the same to me. That was Dilly Keen of fascinating Aida, and uh, now Nicholas Leader's other wear. Well, it's always nice to read fairy stories once in a while, and this week I've been enjoying a whole new collection of them in Samuel Smiles' book *Self Help*. It's true they are short on princesses, or indeed any females, but strong on everything else. Typical Smiles heroes are born in poverty, which is just as well, as then they have the stimulus to overcome these obstacles. They may still be dunces at school, but once employed, soon learn to put everything into their work, becoming increasingly cheerful the more they get through. On rare moments of leisure, they prefer Bacon's essays to the odd glass of whiskey. <laughs> Finally, they make their inevitable breakthrough to fame. All that is required of them now is to enjoin others to show the same qualities of energy and thrift, while always accepting as little aid from outside as it is possible to get. So, at any rate, run the contents of this famous book, reissued this week by Penguin, with an enthusiastic forward by Sir Keith Joseph. I'm not surprised he so much approves, given that under his regime as Education Minister, self-help for pupils and state schools is now more important than ever. But I did find myself longing, after a while, for the 20th century rejoinder to Samuel Smiles, by which, of course, I mean the Book of Heroic Failures. For too many tales of success following great efforts smack of the headmaster's address or a reader's digest editorial. We know life is more complex than that, and that some people always fail, however hard they work. And as for the author of self-help himself, had he been born in much tougher circumstances, who can tell whether here too the smiles could well have ended up on the other side of Samuel's face? Yeah, now you make it sound a little too, what shall I say,、uh, lightweight. You see, but in an age, at a time when canting politicians are ogling the word Victorian as though it had no associations with selfishness, poverty, disease, and humbug, we have to take books like this, reissues, I should say, of books like this, much more seriously than it has been your. Care to do what I dislike? Well, I, I have several feelings about the book, principally one of, a, of distaste.、Uh, but there is a triumphal, a vaunting note, which is not the least of the disagreeable elements in the work. This booming、uh, sort of.、Uh, Trumpeting smiles, he's confecting cure-alls, just like patent medicine, really. And the text, this is really my real quarrel. The text is littered with hubris, so that as you read through it, not just for Samuel Smiles, but all those who seem politicians again to associate themselves with that and him. You positively find yourself listening for the thunder of the appalling smile slipping down a coal hole as the celestial banana skin has been slipped under him. I have much more to say in this vein, but I'll stop at that point. Say,、uh, to, I think he's got to be saved a little bit、uh, from because, in terms of some of his contemporaries, he was a person who was probably less given to celebrating sheer materialistic values. I mean, the man. He, he did. He was addicted to advice. 
certainly. I mean, the amount of advice, <laughs> the sheer, the sheer pantechnican yes. of advice. I mean, he even actually, at one time, insisted upon his books being highly priced because he believed unless they were highly mm. priced, they wouldn't be given out as school prizes. And that was his <laughs> main <laughs> aim in writing, that they I would be it. school it. prizes. But it has to be remembered that, that at the time, what he was writing against were two things. I mean, he was writing against the aristocracy, in, in particular, and he was writing against the working class and the aristocracy of the 18th century, uh, before, before Smiles, the aristocracy that he was attacking, the working class that he was attacking, had rather similar values. I mean, they're not only interested in blood sports, and they're not only rather sexually promiscuous, but they believed in the idea of like, pleasure uh, for its own sake. And here was Smiles trying to find a way in which the middle class, the business values, could be honoured. He was trying to find a place for a new class. Yes, he, he uh, sort of uh, says that money is not the be-all and end-all, but just in order to enlarge the market, having offered a sort of moralising position in which the rich man, the rich parvenu, a Victorian parvenu, could then luxuriate in the riches he accumulates to enlarge the market, he hastens to point out that even the poor man who has done his best has his whack of self-righteousness and can look down his nose, can poultice his envy of the rich man by pleasing himself by supposing that the rich man is both wicked and unhappy. What I noticed about it was, first of all, a... a constant massaging of the evidence to support his point of view. For instance, he airily comments that, about Shakespeare that there's no question that he sprang from humble rank and that the common class of day labourers gave us Ben Jonson. Well, there's abs this is totally false as a piece of historical material. And he's simply interested in putting over this totally specious philosophy that anybody can do it. Now, this isn't naive. He's too clever to be naive. But it is a very, very damaging myth. He completely ignores the structural and institutional barriers to people's here, here. progress. Here, here. Here, here. It is not possible for everybody to, by, by diligence and endeavour, to become President of the United States. No, he you points out continuously that's... people who have triumphed mm. over their disadvantages, the condition of disadvantage, thereby, if you think, reminding us of all those for whom the condition of, of disadvantage continues and cannot be absolutely, triumphed. Absolutely, absolutely. expect more of him than his time. Sorry, Milton. Oh, no, no, well, that isn't what come they, back oh, to we're that, We're talking Laurie. about 1857, well, no, no, well, 1986. We're talking about 100 years years ago. And we're talking about the values that this man felt were necessary for a country which at that stage was the most powerful and most respected in the world. And one of those was pride. What is interesting about this book is that people who are successful are proud of themselves and they're proud of their country. And there's a, an, an area of, of, of uh, patriotism which, which we have in this country now denigrated ever since, I suppose, 1945, probably began in the 30s, in which we're no longer proud of either ourselves or our country compared to the Russians, compared to the Americans. And I think one can uh, uh, say that one of the reasons why we are slipping in world grandeur and in world power is because of the inability of ourselves to look at ourselves and say, it is a good thing to be British. You know, there are a certain number of people who are. You know, we know that probably most people in this country are, but we know that the people who run the media, the people who run, write plays, people who write novels. I cannot think of a single play that proud of being British since Cavalcade. Milton, and he's I, not I, on about... Not one, but I can think of a hundred plays that have denigrated and produced the guilt that the British have had about their empire past and what they're now going through. But he's I not believe, talking believe, about being it, proud. It what he's talking about is self-satisfaction. He keeps saying that wealth and power are not the goal, and I'm quoting now, but happiness and self-satisfaction. Self-satisfaction. The whiff of complacency and no, moral no, superiority. No, no, no. And, all but that. and Milton says the period he was writing in, that is also the period when Dickens was writing, when George Eliot was writing, and I don't think we would look to them. You see, self-help self -help as, you see, Milton, I think, was inflating the whole thing, that you were generalising the thing. This fellow's going on about self-help, I think, in somewhat the same way. None of us can get by. I mean, we have to apply to our own time, otherwise it's a mere antique that we're talking about. None of us, as individuals, has ever been able to d uh, d dispense with self-help. But once you get self-help mm. elevated into a kind of philosophy, I say it's someone talking who's made a fortune and he's 
now trying to canonize no, it. No, but you see, <laughs> that is very much... You do have to talk about the time that he was writing, That's because right. when, what you say now is perfectly right. What, what Rosalind says now is absolutely right, to mm. talk about... This is why I object so much to Keith Joseph's introduction to this, mm. because to suggest... Uh, that, in fact, the circumstances now, that the unemployed person now could, in fact, resort to self-help mm. in order to do something about yeah, increasing yeah. his chances of employment in Sunderland or something like that, I mean, that is absurd, that the argument is ridiculous. But what is being constructed here is a certain sort of morality, a morality which didn't really exist before, which says that through knowledge, through education, you've got to remember that Smiles is one person who's in favour of state education. He was in, in, I mean, he ran a great many risks in running the Leeds Times, which is a rap who's in favour of state education. He was one of the leading people to get public libraries established. He said the most important thing as far as he was concerned when asked, he said knowledge, knowledge. The ignorant man passes through the world dead to all pleasures save those of the senses. Well, and he said yes, that, that, can that, that was, no, no, that let, was let, what let, his let, life was about. Let's have right, Nicholas right. now. Well, you see, uh, uh, Laurie, I think... He did say that, but he also was very much against something that you and I are both employed in higher education. It's much better to go and get your hands dirty in the foundry and all this sort of business. And I, I think we should look upon him as writing fables, that, that people enjoyed reading him, even if they were living, I imagine, in poverty themselves, because there's this sort of feeling that it might be all right, rather the same sort of myths that are peddled by love comics and all that sort of thing now. But I think, on the other hand, the distasteful part of him is that you do get the feeling from Samuel Smiles that if you're poor, it's all your fault. No, no, and I, I think, no, 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 no it's, it's pretty awful mm. to be poor. But to be told this is due to your own moral failings, I think is actually that disgusting. Is disgusting. Even, worse that, even worse than that, even worse than that is to say that you can be poor on honourable grounds. And I find that, you see, underneath it all, yes, he might have been radical for his mm. time, locally radical, shall we say. But what I find the I I I implicit throughout is this claim that we are all self-sufficient or able to be self sufficient, mm. all masters of our fate. Mm. I find that both untrue yes. and bad-mannered. It's a continuous roar of self-satisfaction yes. uh, which excludes, and this is my point, which excludes the element of luck. But people who think in that way, mm. they do not recognise that possibly the determining factor in people's uh, lives, whether they fail or whether they succeed, or whether, like most of us, they come in between, is the element of chance, of luck, the inheritance yes. of nature and nurture, Absolutely. which no one has and ever been able to prescribe for themselves the, since the crack of and doom. And one of the most basic inheritances is whether you are male or female. And one of the things Fair I have enough. against this book is that it is an absolutely odious world of men. Right. It goes on constantly about manly dependence, manly independence, manly reliance, manly self-reliance. Yes, yes, yes. Nicholas touched on this. And he ago, quotes, he quotes but we're George Eliot to our was all also Times writing at well. that time, and that was not her attitude. He quotes Palissy with approval, who in his desperate search for the secret of enamelling, broke up his chairs and cupboards to the <laughs> screams of his wife and children. Yeah. I shudder to think of men buying this yeah. book today. I know, I what I think is significant yeah. is this book has been reissued now with a foreword by Keith Joseph. Men buying this today, getting inspired to put these precepts into action, when all over the country, women are seeking therapy and leaving their mm. husbands simply because men put work above family yeah. life. You're right, right. Sounds to me like somebody wants to revise Shakespeare. No, though, she's like Desdemona <laughs> to be an all-in wrestler who, in the event, you know... Um, a uh, feminist uh, all-in wrestler. Uh, yeah. ...manages Chitty to beat Othello. You know, uh, this, this total nonsense of putting uh, into, the, into the thoughts and minds of a writer a hundred years ago all the kind of loopy ideas we now <laughs> have about sexism. Nicholas is quite right to say that this was a person who believed that poverty was a result of the habitual improvidence of, of, of the mm. working class and that they could all pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And of course you're quite right to talk about the ways in which there was no recognition uh, gradually, as the sort of late like 19th century went on, there was a recognition, largely because as the middle class became coherent and articulate, mm. and people like Smiles are their representative, similarly, the working class organized in order to make its voice heard mm. and to say, no, what you say we should be doing cannot be done, and join together and form those very organizations mm. which would do something to make it possible. So you're quite right, all those institutional restraints which made it po impossible mm. for people to carry out what Smiles was saying. But 
this sadness, in a way, of smiles is carrying forward. Because, I mean, there were people then. I mean, the, such was the state of the country and the industrial possibilities which existed that the ways in which people could make their way through, the sadness comes when you move on to the Willie Lomans of the world yes. who are endeavouring to self-help mm. yes. in a situation in which there are not even those yes. possibilities but, yes, available. It, and it yes. becomes very much more important mm. than, as I say, a little antique work that we only pick up to give a, ourselves an opportunity to have a little conversation mm. about when such as Keith Joseph, though I don't, yes. I name him, but simply because he wrote the preface, um, start getting keen on this sort of self-improvement and mm. looking back to the self-improvement that he so much admires in the Victorian days, 1860, I think, is the time of this book. Uh, and he says in his preface, uh, at a time when people didn't look to governments to help them, that they actually uh, <laughs> brought themselves up, and he says this admiringly, but it can be construed in quite another way, in which a society which has two which was, in essence, two societies. Mm. One society, having uh, made itself secure, pulled up the ladder and let the rest get on to it. Now, that, get on with it. That is simplistic, but it's no more simplistic than looking on a society which actually takes responsibility for all its members and describing it as a handout agency for... Joseph, 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 Joseph should remember I, Disraeli, I, I think Disraeli, who three years before this used exactly that two yes. nations thing. Yeah, no. There's a really chilling moment in the book when he quotes Napoleon Napoleon with great admiration. Yes, I noticed And that. when he said, mm. Napoleon, when he was told about the Alps, said, there shall be no Alps in, in my way. And then when he was told some manoeuvre in battle was impossible, Napoleon said with smile sort, great sort of um, uh, uh, presence of mind, impossible is a word only to be found in the dictionary of fools. Now, I can just imagine some First World War general taking that to heart, sending his men out over the top of the song. Where you all misinterpret this book, you, you, you this is a book written at a period of time when work and energy were considered virtues, when it was necessary for a society that was going through, um, uh, had, hadn't got the technological achievements that we have now, was trying to get people to enter into uh, an arduous effort to improve the lot of everyone through effort, through energy, whatever you like to call it. Now, if you want to attack the book in terms of 1986, then you say, we are now, we're in a different world because of the technological revolution, which we say, work is the opium of the people. In other words, what we say now, leisure is the uh, aim of all mankind, and a man who accepts leisure gracefully is a patriot. And the idea of striving to work when there is no work and will never be any work, you have a, uh, the reverse angle of this book. And I think in that sense, it, you can't apply it to today, but it has the same... It has the same connotation, that accepting leisure today is the same idea as accepting work in 1857. That's why there is something mm. brutal about an introduction which suggests mm. that all the time that people could apply mm. it today. And I, I just re referred to Willie Lohman before, because I could hear that sound, in a way, all through this book. And it was a sort of advice that he... And I just looked up that little... Quotation, somebody saying about Willie Lohman, you know, in Death of a Salesman, that Willie Lohman never made a lot of money. His name was never in the paper. He's not the finest character that ever lived, but he's a human being, and a terrible thing is happening to him, so attention must be paid. Yes. There's not but much evidence of anyone paying attention. And the way we cannot really put the book in the perspective of its hundred and twenty-year oldness is that it is taken up as a text by at least... Uh, Sir Keith Joseph at the beginning and many another politician like him as though they would drag these elements into our own day and I would like to end by saying that the element, I repeat what I said earlier the element of chance and the entirely random which is, you know, giving to fate what is fate's and not your own is wholly excluded from consideration here and it's this rebarbative claim to self-sufficiency which I think makes such claptrap philosophers and there are enough now and there were enough then, offensive to all who had the slightest intuition of the precariousness of the human condition and human society. Dr. Rosalind Miles, Milton Shulman, Nicholas Tucker and Professor Laurie Taylor were stopping the week with Robert Robinson. Dilly Keene, a fascinating Aida, provided the musical interlude and the programme was produced by Michael Ember. Oh.